Hi, welcome to the Rachel Hollis Analysis Channel. <laughs> While I'm hot on a topic, for me, I like to just dive on in, jump into it, make sure that I have explored it at every angle. So while I'm really interested in the Rachel Hollis saga, I wanted to continue my exploration of her, her career, her advice, her life. But today I wanted to watch an interview that was uh, recorded after her divorce and after her latest book came out. So it kind of offers a more in-depth analysis of her post-perfect relationship Rachel that she uh, put on for the cameras. This interview came out October of 2020, so that gives you a time frame. And again, we're gonna go to Impact Theory, my new favorite YouTube channel, not really, but my favorite YouTube channel to watch these self-help influencers talk about their theories and their life and blah, blah, blah. Let's watch it analyze. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Conversations with Tom. I am here for somebody who's gonna help me ring, ring in the, uh, the new episode here on the set, Rachel Hollis. Thank you so much for joining me and for helping me smash the bottle of champagne on the set. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. I'm also glad that you got the memo about wearing yellow yes, today. So we matched. We're ready to rock Not and roll. On purpose. I have to say right off the bat before we even really start the interview, she looks different here. Uh, I'm not trying to shame her at all. I think she looks beautiful, honestly, this way or her more done up way. Um, but she looks like she's had some late nights or she's been crying. She's much more dressed down, comfortable, um, not as much makeup. And I think it's almost kind of refreshing. I'm hoping, I haven't watched this interview yet. This is kind of like my live reaction, but I'm hoping that it's not a gimmick <laughs> into which now this is her character. I'm hoping that it, this is just how she's truly feeling. She decided to show up as she truly is, but we shall see. I'm gonna sum it up in a way that I think you'll probably disagree with, but this is what it felt like to me. Okay. And as one of the most upbeat, optimistic people I have ever come across in my life, it is so fun to be around you because you're so intense in a way that I resonate with, and I know we will talk about tonight. Um, why write a book about dealing with trauma? Right, um, so. I, I almost feel bad for her given this question because it's like, you can be positive and have a positive mindset and also go through trauma. And obviously 99% um, of people have trauma or have some sort of negativity in their life at some point. I mean, it's, it's nearly impossible for someone to go through life never experiencing anything negative or what they perceive to be negative. So him asking this, why write a book about trauma? Because you're the most positive person in the world and I love being around you because you're so positive. So why like, you know, just rain on my parade, Rachel. It's kind of like a weird question. And she almost laughs like, okay. Um, well, because number one, I can make money. And number two, I think people can relate to trauma. But all right. I got into quarantine uh, beginning, or maybe second week in March, we went into quarantine. We shot, um, we had the company, everyone go virtual. And um, that first, I want to say 10 days, I really freaked out. I think most of us were freaking out all around the world. Um, as, as an entrepreneur, you were as an entrepreneur. Out? Yeah. Um, so our business, uh, the largest part of our revenue comes from our live events. Mm. And I had no idea when that would happen again. And I have 60 employees who, Ooh. right, it's big, um, who, you know, pay bills. And, and the reason I freaked out when I first went into quarantine is because I knew. So I've been an entrepreneur for 17 years. And that means that I held a company together through 08. Mm. And I, it was like a visceral, like I remembered it so fast and I, it was like, okay, here we go again. And the first you know, couple weeks I freaked out and I drank too much vodka, which is an old coping mechanism of mine. So she admits that she drank too much vodka in the beginning of quarantine, which I think is a, a something that people can probably relate to again. Um, but when Dave drank too much, she was not okay with it. She was like, you need to leave. Trouble, I had a troubling time with alcohol and my wife, Best, one of the best and worst things about her is the ability for her to be unbelievably direct. And we had a hard conversation about what the heck I'm actually doing. And so I've decided on that day, I am not gonna have a drink for a year. But when she does it, it's like, fine, I guess. Then you hit that moment where you're like, okay, get your shit together. Like there is no other way, you've gotta figure this out. And as I was in that mode of truly like, save my company, save these people's jobs, um, I, was editing 
the book I had already written. So I wrote a book called Girl What the Health, which was all about women and body image and the way that we had talked about right. that. So that's what yeah. I thought that's what was, was going to be this book to write. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, 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 how the hell did she write another right. book that fast? Right. So I um I just it just felt I started editing it and I was like, this is wrong. And so that book is written with my typically my nonfiction books. There's a lot of humor, it's very irreverent. I'm talking about silly things I want to make you laugh so that maybe you're better able to receive um some bigger conversation. And it just felt so tone deaf. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I can't do this. Now the interesting thing about this time period is I've lived through a lot of really shitty things, unfortunately. And I was like, there are some things I know about how to navigate this time. I know that it's going to get better someday. And I know it's going to be brutal in the meantime. Like just because you have hope that tomorrow will be better doesn't mean that you're not self-aware enough to understand that like every day between now and then may be awful. So um, I started thinking about what would I want to say if I could say anything in this time. Is this like March now? This is March, yeah. And there is a part of me, if I'm being honest, as an author, I've always wanted to write a crash book. Do you know Crash Book? No, no, no. So Crash Book, if you've ever seen, um, the best example I can think of, which is, sounds terrible, is like you see a celebrity die. And then it seems like a month later, mm. there's a book on the show. And you're like, how in the world did they do that? It's called a Crash Book. They wrote it really fast. They rushed it through the publishing process. They crashed it. So, okay. So she, she's saying that she wanted to write a crash book. So she wanted to write a book where it was done really fast and not thought about, just very much like a celebrity who has died and someone writes a book about them. So I wonder if that is, I want to write a crash book because I knew that it would be timely, AKA people would want to buy it. Um, especially probably being in quarantine, maybe she thought she would capitalize off of that and people would be wanting books. Especially because 5G apparently is <laughs> behind. <laughs> never, I'm, never mind. Uh, so maybe she thought that a book would be a great way to make some money during this time because her live events were now canceled. Um, I don't think it was necessarily as, as altruistic as she's making it out to be like, I just wanted women to have this book to get better uh, and feel better during quarantine. I think she, she, just, she saw the writing on the wall and writing a book called Girl, What the Health <laughs> and publishing that during a global pandemic um, probably is not the smartest move, especially from someone who has been extremely critical of people who don't stick to diets, who are overweight, has said this about herself. God, like God, it's so bad. Ooh. I look like I got stung by a thousand bees. She tries to frame it here and the, all these self-help gurus do this like, oh, I just wanted to help people going through this. And it's like, mm, you saw a marketing opportunity. You're a mogul. She literally has mogul written on her wrist or her arm. Um, so as a mogul, I think she saw a money-making opportunity, especially when she was suffering from a loss of revenue with her live events and saw this as a way to make some money, make some of that up. Back to the video. As I started to think about what I would want to write, I reached out to my editor and I said, I feel like I need to write something for where we are now. And naively, I was like, I feel like I need something for her, meaning my reader, I need something for her to read when this is over in a couple months which is so dumb, uh, but- Everybody was thinking it was weeks though, back in March. Right. Like this is gonna be a couple yeah, weeks. Yeah, this is like we wild. Went, yeah, we got right. two to three weeks. Right. Like, and then I was like, okay, maybe it's gonna be a month or two. Like right. this could be crazy. Yeah. And <laughs> so that wasn't, it was actually, I would say unusual that you had the foresight to see that this is gonna be longer than just a couple of weeks back then. Cause that was the other thing. I was like, whoa, to commit to a book that is so clearly of the moment mm -hmm. when you don't know, we could be out of quarantine by the time this hits. And then it would almost seem like passe. You know what's interesting is I didn't know when we would be out of quarantine, but I'm wise enough to understand how much this will devastate our economy mm. for years. And so I actually wasn't even really writing for people. I didn't, it wasn't like, oh, I don't know when quarantine ends. It was, it doesn't matter as you and I sit here right now, if quarantine ended, like if it ended tomorrow, if we had the answer tomorrow, our economy is still for years to come because of what's happened. And you and I are both really lucky and really blessed. I'm actually a little surprised that she's using the F word so effortlessly, kind of shocking in a good way, perhaps. Uh, I think she's having an honest moment. Um, she's not really playing up to that Southern Christian ideal client or ideal viewer listener that she tries to talk to all the time. So maybe she's having a more sincere moment. It's not. I mean, you know, if you read it, it's not my normal tone. Mm. Um, it's still. It's got still. Its I tried. Like, it is I very tried. clearly a Rachel Hollis book. I hope so. For like, sure. Yeah. They were like, could you just add like one joke <laughs> in the editing process? Because I still wanted it to be hopeful, and I still wanted to hopefully illustrate things in a way that people could hear, but you're talking about crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, the world has gone through this massive crisis and for many people, they're experiencing loss or it could be traumatic. The PTSD that comes out of this for our healthcare workers, like I, I can't even, we can't even fathom 
what this is going to be. Um, and I don't say that I'm not, you know me, I'm not a pessimistic person, but I do think that this will have far reaching ramifications. I'm like, I don't know why admitting truths, you know, that life is not always perfect and beautiful and amazing and every twist and turn and that you can't control everything in your life at all times because you read a book called The Secret and it told you that you could. Why that is seen as pessimism by just stating facts. I don't get that. I hate that. And you know, this interviewer, Tom, is almost with the leading question of why write a book about trauma when you're such a positive person is unfair and it's not good to have that message be replayed over and over again that if you see something that's unjust or not fair that bringing it to light is somehow you being a pessimist i think that's a very dangerous thing and really only benefits people who want to do you harm and do other people harm without facing any negative repercussions you're just ignoring things that go on that's the only person it really benefits from you calling it out doesn't make you a more negative person it makes you honest and possibly and most likely helping somebody that would be the recipient of the bad actors choices does that make sense let me know in the comments below I'm the same. I'm like crazy optimistic, almost pathologically optimistic. I found one by temperament, I am that way. And then two, it just, as an entrepreneur, you have to find that gear. Otherwise you'll never take the chances that you need to grow. And so when I was the one saying to the team, guys, this could get really right. bad. Like, and I've often said, this is like, the economy has essentially been shot. It's a person who's been shot and they're bleeding out. Nobody knows how serious right. it is yet because That's you're so looking real. at them and they seem fine. Or um, do you know what a space case is? No. I can't believe this shit is real. This is the craziest thing ever. So there, did you see the M. Night Shyamalan movie? Oh God, the one with Mel Gibson, Signs. M. Night Shyamalan? <laughs> okay, also just a total side note, and I'm gonna get into this in a future video where I actually deep dive into Tom, but he's like, oh, I'm such an optimist. I'm a pathological optimist. Okay, it's easy for him to say, when he literally graduated from college, worked at a tech company that was really successful apparently, then went on to start a very, very successful protein bar business called Quest, which I'm sure you've seen at like every store that you've ever gone to and like 7-Eleven and Walmart and everything. Huge, he, this guy's like a multi, multi-millionaire. Then he starts this YouTube channel with his wife where he gets to talk to people all day about like his theories on things. And he's like on Easy Street. So yeah, for him, I think life has been very, very uh, optimistic for him. So for him to say like, oh, I don't have pessimism and therefore no one else should, it's stupid because other people have other issues that have made them more cynical like myself and people who run channels like this. It's like, just because you haven't gone through something that makes you question negative things or question people's uh, intentions more, um, does not make you better or more optimistic. It means that you've been lucky, period. You're luckier. Done. Not more optimistic. There, I mean, there's just, there's loss in, in a bunch of different ways. Um, and I, yeah, I still think there's beauty in this time. And I think that there's goodness. You know me, like I'm gonna look for how is this for us and all of that. But that's what started. The process was like, I just, I think I wanna write something that meets my reader where they're at. Um, Typically, I think I'm writing to try and hopefully guide you somewhere. Mm -hmm. And in this instance, I was like, nah, I'm coming to you. Um, let's, let's walk through this thing together because this is it's going to be hard. Let's go through this together. However, what is it about me that made you think I want to be relatable? No, sis, literally everything I do in my life is to live a life that most people can't relate to. What made you think I want to be relatable? It's interesting. What's fascinating is of course the timing then of your divorce right. and the bizarre sort of cynical voice that has raised its head which there's no well i guess the book hasn't come out yet yeah. so there's no way that they've read it yeah so yeah. once you read it it's like it's clearly not a book about your divorce no. your divorce is mentioned because you were editing when you were going right. through it but um i felt like i had to like i felt like to mention the i had to say it yeah, you know just, right and my audience knows me and i have talked about everything it's a big part of my platform is to be honest about where i'm at and what i've gone through and i thought like this is crazy okay <laughs> That's not true because number one, the divorce came out of nowhere. Um, you know, you were recording 
podcast like a month prior to the divorce announcement where you were saying your relationship has been better than ever. And so what are you talking about? No, <laughs> no. The editor and the publisher, everyone gets on the phone like, hey, you have to address this. Mm. Um, and that felt like I wanted to puke. Like, I, how do you write about something that you're drowning inside of? Okay, so she just said I had to address it. I wanted to make sure that my viewers knew I'm so authentic and blah, blah, blah. And then the next breath, or the same breath, literally, she's like, my editor said, hey, you have to do this. And I wanted to puke. So which is it? You decided that you wanted to be authentic with your audience or your editor said, hey, this is super weird if you just put out this book with this title, didn't see that coming, and you just announced your divorce. Like, people are not gonna understand that this is not about your divorce. You need to at least put it in the book. That sounds like uh, you just wanted to skirt by it and your editor said, this doesn't make sense. I'm confused. But the idea is that you're never supposed to teach from your open wounds. You're supposed to teach from scars. You're supposed to teach from places that have healed over, that you've done the work on. So you can say like, back then, this was something right. that I struggled with. If you are teaching from an open wound, like a current pain in your life, number one, you don't even know how you're gonna feel about that five years from now. And also it's being colored by emotion. And so it doesn't really feel fair to be teaching anyone anything. Do you feel like you taught around your divorce in the book? It didn't feel that way to me. I No, I, and I didn't want to. I only wanted to, um, the book starts there, like this is what happened because I needed to explain that I wrote the entire book and then in the editing process, I was in the midst of a breakup. Mm. And in the midst of a breakup. To me, that language is so bizarre. You're not in the midst of a breakup. You ended or the marriage that you were in and your business partner ended with Dave, who you've featured in like every one of your books and was the CEO of your company. It's not a breakup. That's like such a thing to sound like, I'm just like you, like I was in the midst of a breakup, like just like you, like you and your high school boyfriend who just broke up yesterday. Like, yeah, it's the same thing. It's like, no, <laughs> that's a totally different thing. I feel like it just, it's that pandering to, you know, not acknowledging what it truly is. Like it's a complete deceit of her audience by not talking about the divorce, impending divorce, the relationship problems that they had. Um, and then to say like, I was in the midst of a breakup. Like that's not what it was. It was much more to it than that. And so the first pass was very much what you would normally get from me, like coach and teacher and whatever. And then in, a, in an edit, it changed and it became more nuanced and I um, was in so much more pain trying to write this thing. Um, and it's really weird too. I'll tell you, like I started doing um, press last week, I want to say, and I had the very first call I want to like people. And I mean, that's a big get. And as an author, like that's the kind of thing you dream of, you know, having people magazine care about your book. And I got off that call and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to have this conversation a hundred right times. Go, yeah. Right. And that everybody starts there. What's going on? How are you doing? How are the kids? How, you know, and it's just like, oh my God, this is, um, it's already hard enough. Mm. And I'm also navigating really deeply caring about being respectful of him, sure. and, you know? And if you, if one person then is the only one who's sort of being asked these things that also doesn't feel fair. And mm -hmm. so it's just like, it's a big clusterfuck. Then why have a complete company and brand around sharing your life with people. This is the problem. You can, if, if it's everything is butterflies and sunshine and rainbows and like you're fine with having people talk to you, but if they actually wanna ask you something about your life that you, that is going on, that you are profiting from, but it's negative, oh my God, no, that's so rude. How dare they ask me that? But you wanna make money from putting your story out there. It's just, it's like the, it's not even a catch 22. It's a hypocrisy that exists in this space. They only, these self-help people only want to talk about the good. They don't want to talk about the real. They don't want to talk about the bad or the mistakes that they've made that the mistake, they want to talk about mistakes they've made that they've learned from, recovered from, made money from, and can teach you how to do it too. They don't want to talk about current mistakes or issues going on in their life currently. But then they also want to say, I'm the most authentic entrepreneur that's ever walked the face of the earth. It's like, no, that you can't have it all. 
No one can have it all. You can't either. I was driving over here today and I was like, this is a wild time to be sitting down with Tom, <laughs> right? And I thought, like, I almost texted you and just said, like, I don't want to record a show. I just, like, want to sit with my friends yeah. and talk about all the things. No, the that's that... why we were talking before we started rolling about this, this setup feels too much like we're on a set. As if we're on a set. You are on a set. This is not your house, bro. Like, maybe it is, but it's a room in the house that's set up like a set to be a set. It's literally lit. Like, I can see the giant light in his glasses. Like, how is this not a set? If there's a, a camera, a panning camera that constantly is going back and forth on a slider. Yeah, I don't want this to feel like a set. Like, well, then have this conversation off camera then. God, I just, ugh, I'm sorry. I'm getting, like, frustrated because these people... They just want to like be praised, never judged. Um, everything has to be their way or the highway. And it's like, you can't just say like, oh, just, I don't want this to feel like a set and then set up everything to be a set and literally have a show. <laughs> then just don't do this then. If there's no one's forcing your hand here. <laughs> You are, the ones you are all the ones deciding to sit on camera and talk about this. You're the one who's deciding to write the book. You're the one deciding your fate. So why are you like not accepting the responsibility of that? That's what I can't get to. I can't understand, wrap my head around. Bothers me. I know like one, getting a chance to talk to people that have a very similar life to you is there's so much joy and like, oh my God, only right. you are gonna understand this like, weird, very thing. weird thing. Yeah. It's so amazing to talk to people just like me. I learn nothing. <laughs> cool. <laughs> in the way that you share, in the way that you talk about everything, it does feel like somebody who's not trying to preach or anything, just like, hey, I've, I, I will say that the book had a sense of speaking from the scar and not from the wound, but okay. it was like, look, I've been through this thing, it's gnarly, right. I've been through something like this um, and just, I don't know, and that's your normal style is to sort of walk people through. But when I think about what the promo tour for this book is going to be like, the danger I think for you is the way that when people ask you the same question, you get you develop a loop. And for something that's so live that you're going through right now to become a loop right. is risky when right. you need to process through and right. figure out like what the f is right. actually going on. Absolutely. So the solution here is don't put the book out right now. She did a crash book which means she rushed the book to completion. So it's not like, oh, this was already scheduled and I just had to do it. This is a ploy or a way, I shouldn't say a ploy. This is a way that she's gonna make money and make up the revenue loss from live events. And that's why she's doing it. So him bringing up like, oh, her health and like, you know, she's saying that she doesn't like the press that she has to do on this book and whatever. Like whose fault is that? It's yours. It's your fault because you didn't have to do a book. You didn't have to do press on the book, but you want the book to do well. But I have a feeling that the next couple minutes when she discusses this, and I, like I said, I haven't watched this yet. I have a prediction that she's going to blame it on her readers, her viewers, the press, and everyone else except for herself. But let's see. I'll give her the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I'm wrong. And then things people take sort of snippets instead of the full context of what you said. And it just kind of is I feel like I've hit a place in my life and career where I have learned, like if I care so much about how I am received, I would stop doing anything at all, right? Like so For real, for real, how do you deal with that shit? So when you mentioned in the book, because this is exactly what it is for me, as I was getting bigger, I read every comment. It was awesome. It was a love fest. And I used to tell people, go look at our comments. YouTube is known for like these crazy vitriolic, bitter comments. Our comments are loving and it's uplifting and they're connecting with each other. It's right. so great. And then we hit a million. And mother lost their mind right. and it, it devolved into the standard right. stuff and so i was just like cool I, I will put my thing out i will do my best to like bring value and then it is what it is once it hits the world everyone's a hater right everyone's a troll no one's giving you constructive criticism no one has an opinion that can't be different than yours unless it's positive positive. and it's funny they only want to read the comments when they're positive they don't want to read the negative comments and he's saying like oh it's once i hit a million now the haters come out of the woodwork it's like no, probably like the small amount of people who were going to like you regardless because they eat up every word you say were there in the beginning and now the algorithm's pushing you out to like normal people and now the normal people have something to say because it's like this is garbage and this is not good content or like this when he has um, the guy from The Secret or these scammy people on talking about their like products that they're trying to sell, people have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. I'm a normal seemingly normal person 
um, but you know that I would be considered a hater or any commentary channel would be considered like I'm just jealous of their success which <laughs> I could be jealous of their success but also have a logical and thought out problem with their content but you know they don't like to, to hear that ever ever probably three or four months ago I sent a group text to all of my closest friends and I said I so appreciate and love you I do not consume comments on social media when people say awful things I don't know the tree is falling in the forest. I am not around to hear it. Meanwhile. <laughs> okay, yesterday I was doing a live stream and I mentioned that there's a sweet woman who comes to my house twice a week and cleans. She's my, my house cleaner. She cleans the toilets. Someone commented and said, you are privileged AF. And I was like, you're right. I'm super freaking privileged, but also I worked my ass off to have the money to have someone come twice a week and clean my toilets. And I told her that. And then she said, well, you're unrelatable. <gasps> what is it about me that made you think I want to be relatable? No, sis, literally everything I do in my life is to live a life that most people can't relate to. Most people won't work this hard. Most people won't get up at 4 a.m. Most people won't fail publicly again and again just to reach the top of the mountain. Literally every woman I admire in history was unrelatable. If my life is relatable to most people, I'm doing it wrong. She was responding to a comment and then literally sidelined her entire career for the time being. So this is not true. At least at this time, maybe it was true, doubt it, but uh, for sure in the near future from when this was recorded, it was not true because she literally read a comment from a live stream and had to address it and made herself look like a total idiot. The tree is falling in the forest. I am not around to hear it until you send me a text and say, the thing was, the, the worst than like, oh no, what they're saying about you on social is people who will send a text and be like, hey girl, <laughs> thinking about you. And I'm like, oh no, now they're saying without saying. That literally sounds like a title of her book. Hey girl, thinking about you. <laughs> Which is like some sort of self-help about when you go through a social media uh, embarrassing crisis or something that she'll write her next book about. So don't act like, oh, when someone says, hey girl, that somehow that you're not the one that probably put that in their minds. That's not your entire brand saying, hey girl. And I had this day, it was our fir first or maybe second um, divorce meeting, which is number one in this world, you do that on Zoom. Oh, God. Um, so we're doing something called a collaborative divorce, which is the best possible thing you can do if you have kids. So our attorneys work together and then we have like a mediator, a financial oh. mediator, a, like a therapist, like it's a whole group thing, wow. right? But even then, those are really hard meetings mm. and they're much better now but at the very beginning it was brutal like i thought they were choosing joy hmm i guess they were choosing brutality instead weird so weird it's almost like you're like everyone else going through a divorce huh who would have thought you rachel hollis a human being Never thought I'd see the day. Just the worst two hours ever, just awful. And um, I get off this call and they had told me in advance, they said, you know, make sure you block out about 90 minutes after these calls, which is like, good grief. Like, do you know how much time the worst takes? Like two hours for the meeting plus 90 minutes. Cause they were like, you are not gonna be in a place where you can go have a meeting right after Whoa. this. And I was like, calm down, we're fine. Like we're, no, they're hundred percent right. Wow. And so I get off, I get off this Zoom call and I'm just like a, a mess, a puddle, a like devastated. And I think, I'm like, I need something like I, I need, I need to hear a motivational speech. I need something that, and then I thought, I wonder if anybody has ever created videos on YouTube for people who are going through divorce. I feel like this is like the beginning of her marketing video where she's pitching her next course where she's like, you know, I was sitting, I had just got off the phone with my divorce attorney and I was just crying hysterically. And then I needed a motivational speech and I looked on YouTube and just nothing. There was just no divorce motivation. So I decided right then and there, uh, I was gonna write my the first ever YouTube video script about divorce because I wanted to be my own advocate and, and make this content for other women going through what I went through. Um, but I go on YouTube to look and I like can't, I'm like, well, I'm like, these are terrible, terrible, terrible. And then YouTube suggests a video that's something like all of the reasons why Rachel Hollis is awful. 
Lovely. And it has hundreds <laughs> of terrible. thousands of views. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. it's recommended to mm -hmm. me. And I'm like, oh, wow. And at that moment, you have to laugh. Now, I'm not, I don't know what it was. I'm not going to watch that. I'm right. sure there's tons of stuff like that on the internet. <laughs> but in that moment, I, it's like, you're just like, I'm already on the ground. Mm. Like, I can't take any more kicks. It's divine intervention. Somebody upstairs wanted you to see that video. If this was a positive video about her, she would tell the story as if like the secret, you know, the universe, she was bringing this to her, attracting this because she deserves all the amazing things in the world because she is a enlightened being and she has done the work and she's worked so hard and blah, blah, blah. So she's bringing this like positive, the 20 reasons why Rachel Haas is the best boss babe ever. But because it's negative, She's saying, oh, how awful the creator of this video is. And like, it just so happened that I saw it and it has nothing to do with my beliefs or feelings or anything like that. I, I, it was out of my control and these are people are just haters. I can understand, I'll give her a little bit of grace here, that, that it must be really hard to watch videos about yourself and people who don't like you and, you know, subjecting yourself to that type of scrutiny might not actually benefit you mentally. Um, so searching it out might not make sense. However, your whole brand and your whole business is motivating people and, and sticking up for yourself and, uh, surviving against adversity. So maybe that would be something to challenge yourself. And that's another thing, you know, you're all about challenging the status quo and challenging yourself to get through hard things. Watching a video that's critical of you would be a hard challenge to overcome. Why are you afraid of that? You tell everyone, don't be afraid of what people talk about you. That's not necessarily the same advice as don't listen to any advice from people. It's hearing the advice, taking it into consideration maybe, and then moving on. I think that's a better advice. Go and see what people are saying maybe fix a couple things. Maybe you're coming off in a way that is hurting people who could benefit from you, but you'll never know because you can't handle the criticism. So my camera literally died on the tripod. It was at 100% when I started this video. So I think that's the sign that I need to take a break and do a part two because there's a lot more to talk about. There's so much more to discuss. So if you're watching this still, Stick around, I'm gonna have part two coming up soon and subscribe and then I'll see you in the next one. I hope you like this one. Oh, look, my little sanctuary area. Oh, it's like a little room tour. If you like yoga and Buddha and plants, you'll love my office. All right, I'll see you later, bye.